in the upcoming half hour, you will learn a lot about in-app purchases. These are payment products that are mandatory if you are trying to sell virtual products or services on the App Store. If you are looking to sell your own products on the App Store, or maybe your employer is looking for a trusted business model, then this will be most relevant to you. I'll provide an overview of the types of in-app purchases, how the API workflow can be, how an app can manage its in-app purchases inventory, some case studies on in-app purchases, and of course the obligatory code demo near the end of the talk. A short intro about me. With ACP from 2013 to 2016, I was work on their smart smart cities efforts and their indoor navigation projects. With NCS, I delivered Singtel's short-lived price file app, if you heard of it. That was me helped with a good team from China. I also have been developing my own products for Mac, iOS, and TVOS as a quote-unquote side job. You, for more of my profile, you can connect me on LinkedIn or scan that QR code to get my full profile. Yes, shortly, we will see what in-app purchase types are. These are non-consumable, non-renewing, auto-renewing, and subscription. Non-consumable, just like book. Probably the most common in-app purchase that we have right now is a toggle on, meaning that it goes from disable to enable, and that's it. Similar to like buying a book. One interesting use of in-app purchases is that you can use it for trial periods. We'll talk about more about this later on. You can also provide it for upgrade discounts, meaning that if uh, an older version of your app is installed, you provide this in-app purchase for upgrade. Or if a competitor's app is installed, you can also provide a discounted upgrade using in-app purchase. Non-consumable data are present in the receipt. The receipt file is a file that is cryptographically signed by Apple, so you can verify its validity. It contains all transactions, including non-consumable. So, non renewing subscription, just like a tourist pass. You can buy multiple times, and it expires after a certain period of time. It is meant for purchases that are maintained manually, meaning that users keep on buying and buying and buying themselves. The duration is typically hard to in the app. So the app needs to know this purchase is for one week, this purchase is for three months, and so on and so forth. The feature can toggle on or toggle off, meaning that once the subscription lasts, you need to toggle it off. And you also can get a history of purchases in the receipt file. Take note that Apple review will probably need to have you to have this sentence in your UI when you are offering in a purchase for subscription. Okay, auto renewing subscription. This is the holy grail of SaaS software as a service. Apple would keep on rebuilding the user until the user cancels. And guess what? You still need to cancel from iTunes. Cannot do it from your app. So you get you have an excuse to not provide the UI on your app. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The receipt will contain the uh, in-app purchase as well, the receipt file. And take note of these legalese that you need to put in your app when you do it subscription purchases. Uh, auto renewing subscription supports subscription groups, meaning that a group that can only one be active at a time, and these are typically different durations of the same product. You can configure the group in, ah, uh, okay, consumable. Consumable in app purchases are often found in games. The purchase can be consumed by the user. Take note that the receipt data receipt data is not present. The receipt will not the receipt will not have consumable purchases. But 
your app will need to have restore pages as well. If the user installed on another device, users will expect to have restore pages as well. And therefore, you need to have a back end to keep track of on these purchases. Here's a summary of in-app purchase types. Non-consumables can be bought only once. Consumables would need to reside on your back end. These in-app purchases have their own validity period. Non-consumables should always be valid, but consumables will degrade as the app is being used. Now, this section will discuss a sequence of calls that you need to do when you are implementing in-app purchases. This will be listing products, making a purchase, restoring purchases, and validating purchases. In a typical in-app purchase store, you probably need to have a list of products that the user can buy. So, how do you do this? First, the app creates an SK products request object and give it the collection of product IDs to receive. These product IDs are typically hard-coded in the app since you need to maintain a relationship between the product ID and the features that the product ID enables. Then, set the delegate. After that, call start. This will invoke a confirmation dialog, system confirmation dialog, and along with some network calls to Apple. After a while, you get a callback. Product request did receive. You will get the localized title, localized description, and localized price. Take note, do not keep this data inside your app. Why? Exchange rates. Exchange rates change every time. The price needs to be displayed in the user's currency, not in your app store uh, developer ID currency. That's why, along with the price, around the title and the description as well. These are maintained inside the App Store Connect. Now, making a purchase. This is the workflow that your app does when your user selects an a purchase, the click buy button. To ask the App Store for the user's money and to enable the features that the user has bought. First, you call Add transaction observer as usual to the object, giving it the callback that giving it the callback up, callback object that will receive the transaction progress. Then you create an SK payment object. Just give it the product ID that the user has purchased. After that, how do what? You wait. You wait, right? After you add payment, you wait. And as the user buys the product, maybe enter their password and confirm him. This is the time where the system display is confusion dialog. Afterwards, you get a callback. Payment queue updated transactions. And you respond by enabling your features. But enabling your features and updating in your inventory. Meaning that user so and so have bought this product and I have to enable these features. Now, if the user installs the app or install it on another device, he or she would expect the, your purchases to be enabled as well, right? This is the restore purchase flow. Apple's support for restoring purchases works for almost all in a purchase except consumables. You need to provide restore purchases for consumables from your own backend. How do you do? Now this flow is for the other in app purchases, the non, the not consumable ones. First, as before, you add a transaction observer to the SK payment queue. Then call restore completed transactions, which will indirectly make a network request to the app store. Then you will get a callback payment queue after the transactions. You should respond by updating the in-memory state of the app, enabling or disabling features as required. Remember that your callback may be called multiple times in a loop, so just be aware of it. 
At the end of the loop, you will get payment queue installed for free transaction. This is a good time to stop the spinners and enable the UI. Finally, you shouldn't call the store transactions yourself unless you can ask for it because that will involve a login dialog that from the user's address his or her Apple ID. If done without a user consent, that is suspicious as best and inconvenient, inconvenient for the user. Therefore, at startup, you will need to verify your receipt yourself. How do you do this? First, call NS Bundle. Where's the receipt? App Store receipt URL. You will get a receipt to a local file containing the cryptographically signed receipt file containing a history of purchases. Everything but consumable. Then what do you do? You read it, you validate it, and you update your own inventory. Take note that there's no API for this. Each developer will need to come up with their own unique implementation of reading receipts, validating receipts, and updating inventory. Why? This is to prevent widespread cracking, meaning have a cracker utility to crack all App Store apps. By having developers having their own unique implementation, it reduces the possibility of having one app to crack everything else. See, now, data model classes. The main goal of these classes is to be the <coughs> single point of contact to answer things like, have the user purchase X? How much balance for product type Y? And is feature X enabled if you have more, more than one, one feature per, per product? This is not the types of in-app purchases, but the inventory of the purchases that user has for, for an app. This is the class hierarchy. I came up with this class hierarchy when I was developing my own product. It became complete because I had to switch through a number of in-app purchase types. I started at subscription, the auto renewing subscription, and that was rejected. Then I moved to non renewing subscription, that was rejected as well. Then I go to the non consumable, which finally got, got accepted. It was a long journey, and fortunately, and now I have this class heresy which you can reuse in your app as well. Let's start with the root product inventory item. This holds the common attributes for all product inventories. Remember, this is the inventory of purchases that the user has made. The most important one will be product identifier, which contains the product ID that matches with the one in the app store. And the last transaction date, maybe just for display purposes usually. Next, we have a toggle product inventory item. This is uh, the base class for 75% of all in-app purchase types. It goes from disabled to enabled or disabled. Again, back and forth. That's why it's called toggle. The non-consumable product inventory item is the most common toggle product inventory item. It goes from disabled to enabled and that's it. It doesn't, doesn't add much method beyond, beyond the one that's provided by the toggle product inventory item, but you need to have these things for type checking and like. Also, if you implement a $0 in-app purchase trials, you probably need to subclass this class as well for in-app purchases that expires after a few weeks is being purchased. More on that later on. Subscription product inventory item can go from disabled, enabled to disabled and back again. That's why there's a base class for it. The most important thing is the expiry date. And it has a group which group the products group the products that uh, a product inventory item may have. This usually the uh, if you offer multiple tiers of the same product, you put it in a group. Next the non-renewing product inventory item. It has a subscription duration. Why? 
non-renewing products of kitchen need to have the duration inside the app, hard coded inside the app, because the app store does not maintain it for you. However, an auto-renewing subscription just have the product duration maintained in the app store. Different things, remember? Non-renewing, you maintain the duration yourself. Auto-renewing, you maintain the duration in the app store. And finally, consumable product inventory items. This is like gasoline or coins or credits that you put into the SIE app. Remember that you need to keep the number of purchase items inside your server, right? And then communicate regularly to reduce that, to deduct that amount that the user has bought. Now, some business cases that are maybe common, maybe not common in in-app purchases. We'll discuss about free trials, holiday sale, and watch OS add-on. So, according to section 312A of the app review guide, you can provide a trial period now. This was a many people's struggle and negotiation effort, so you really, really need to be thankful to them. It's implemented by a pair of non-consumable non in purchases, whereas one is the $0 trial in a purchase, there's a, there's a non-consumable for $0, and the other one is the one with pricing on it. The happy flow will go like this. User will download the app, then user would buy the $0 in-app purchase. This would unlock features of the app, and when the user like it, and the user, when the user like it, the user will buy the feature which buys the other in-app purchase and unlocks the feature indefinitely. But if the user doesn't buy it, then the the non the zero dollar in a purchase will expire by itself. How do you do this? You look at the purchase date plus some weeks, and that will be the trial period. Remember that all in a purchase site has a purchase date. But the app needs to be useful without a purchase. Say as a viewer for its own file type, if it's a document app. <coughs> One example that does this is Omnigrapho, which is a technical slash business drawing application. You can use it as a viewer and for its own file types without purchasing, or you can buy the buy the 14 day in a 14 day trial in a purchase. They also implement an upgrade can mechanism this way. If you have an older version of the app, you can upgrade at a newer version for a cheaper price. Now there is a question on Apple's developer forum asking, how can you have an in-app purchase that's available sometime in the future, only for a limited time, but if the user bought it uh, during that time, it will be available forever. And you can take a guess. If an in-app purchase can be made available in the future, if the user bought it in, in that feature, then it will be available for the rest of the app last time. But it's only available at that time. So, can you tell us how to do this? 21? 25? Holiday special. Holiday special? Yeah, this is a holiday special in a podcast. Please. How do you do this? Is there a holiday special toggle? No. Okay. How do you do that? Let's say today is September. You want it to be available for holiday special in December. Okay. The answer is to have a non consumable product that's only visible during that time. Only. And if the user bought it, then it's there. If, if it passed that period, then it's gone. But you also need to make it available during app preview as well. Remember that if the app reviewer doesn't see your in-app purchase, they won't like you to, like you to approve it. So you control the visibility by having the in-app purchase available during app review and during the holiday period. 
You can control that using timing or using a switch on your backend. Now, watchOS add-on. How do you sell a watchOS app? Of course, watchOS 6, you can sell it without an iOS app. But what if the watchOS app is an add-on to the iOS app and really needs the iOS app? You really need to know that uh, you need to make sure that the user, to when the user buys the in-app purchase, the user only have a watch, uh, have, a, have a watch OS attached to the iPhone itself. Remember that not all, uh, not all watches can be attached to iOS, such as the the, I, the iPad or the Apple Touch. They cannot be attached to our watch OS. How do you make sure? You need to make sure that the app is installed before you display the in-app purchase. This is how you do it. First, the iOS install the WatchOS app, and then the WatchOS app notify the iOS app that it is installed. Right? When it's installed, you any only when you get a signal from the WatchOS app, you say, "Yes, show this in-app purchase." And after that, when the in-app purchase is purchased, you signal back to the WatchOS app, enable yourself. Okay, now for the code demo. We're going to explore the contents of a receipt file. This receipt file contains a history of in-app purchases and cryptographically signed by Apple so that you can verify that it's genuine. For this demo, we are going to look at the copy of a receipt, a genuine one obtained from one, 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 one of my apps during development. I'll be using a TP in-app receipt library that you can get from CocoaPod for reading receipt files. Now let's, let's go to Playground. Okay, so this is the receipt file that I already have. Uh, already have installed. Uh, that's why we'll receive. When this is real one, you will get re the receipt URL from NS bundle, not from. You get from the of the EMP URL bundle. And we see the file. So this is the banner and the guitar of the app that that was used to generate the receipt. And these are the purchases. I was testing the subscription in-app purchase here. So you can see uh, this is product ID, product ID, and you have the transaction ID here, the original transaction ID here. Remember that for subscription, every transaction it has an ID. But the first one will have the original transaction ID. You have the purchase date. You have the original purchase date, which is the starting one. And the expiration date of the subscription. On the end line of order, order line of ID. Okay. Now. Summary of the purchase type, remember, non-consumable can be bought only once, but it's available for eternity. For, con 
for consumable, you don't have it on the receipt. You need to keep it on your, your own backend. Yes, take note of these of purchase type. And that's it what I have for now. This is my contact info if you like to connect with me. Any questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, for, for the non -consumable. non -consumable. For the one that doesn't expire. Uh. Uh, do you feel any best like, practices you can share on how you test for those? How to test for those? Yeah, because they don't expire. So, so what I did the time was when I buy it uh, on, on the Mm. Uh, it stays there forever. Yeah. Uh, I can't validate uh, this uh, so Oh. A new account every time I test it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one way. Or you could create a new product ID. Uh, Another way. Just create a new product. Yeah, new product ID as, as well. Uh, but um, it would be a good practice if you keep your receipt file. Okay and use that as unit tests. That was very useful for testing, from my, my point of view. But keep in mind that uh, you need to remember that a receipt file will have a device ID in there. You have an ID of your device in there. So you need to disable the validation of the device ID when you run it in unit, unit test. Otherwise, it works on your laptop and someone else's laptop, it breaks or it moves to your CI and it breaks. So you, you, when you do that, when you do the, your validation, right, disable the device ID validation. No? Okay, good luck with your business, and thank you. I have a yes. So uh, when a customer buys, the money goes to Apple first and then to you? Money always goes to Apple first and <laughs> yeah, 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 then it goes to Apple first and then usually until until something around 2010, uh, they buffer it until it reach $200, then they give it to you. But now they tend to flush everything every month. So you get it at the end of the next month. Yes, the question. Can you base can you use any kind of updates in iOS 13? They are still the same. Still the same. I uh, no updates and still no family sharing for in purchase. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I have a question. If we want a uniform solution for iOS, what will be your suggestion? Independent or not really on third party? <laughs> there is a loophole or in-app purchase, right, for the loophole. It's called viewer app. It's called viewer app in, in, in the app store review guide. Meaning that if the user sign up to your website, right, and bought the stuff there, you don't need to use in-app purchase. So your solution will be, start on the web first, start the business there first, then you have apps for iOS and Android. Therefore, you can go over, not, not providing in a purchase. Another question. Yes. How is Apple is reviewing this kind of app when uh, you sell internationally? How is reviewing? The how part, I don't know. There's a guy there in the back. I think no idea. Yeah, how part, I don't know. Uh, all I see is that you need to provide the product ID, local description, and price. And you need to provide a screenshot. How the screenshot is being used to review the app is just beyond me. But we take note that apps, the Apple reviewers would need to see the app purchase, and they have their, their own opinion of in app purchases. Another thing is that if you want to do a subscription, you need to have a cloud service attached to your app. Even though if it's a SaaS, you can say it's a software service, if you don't have cloud service, it will be very likely that your app will get rejected for subscription. Could you also provide the sandbox and one? What? Sandbox and one. Yeah. Yes, you can. You can provide, they will provide, they, 
during testing, during testing, and I believe test flight, you can use a sandbox account, which you can you, you go to iTunes, right? You go to iTunes Connect, and then you go to a to a script to create this thing called sandbox account. Again, you can use it for purchasing. What's nice with that with that sandbox account is that the subscription duration is much shorter. I think because, uh, one day becomes five, five minutes or one day becomes one second and then one week can five minutes also. Or, so you can test it really, really quickly. Any experience you want to share with regard to the when it comes to writing unit test cases for this? Yeah, one experience. Uh, when you do it the first time without any test, right? Uh, keep your receipt file as a, as a backup. That will be very useful for for integration for, for unit test later, later on. And second, you need to separate your inventory logic, which means the logic that <coughs> says, yeah, user has product A, B, and C, and A is enabled, B is disabled, C is enabled, with the one that validates and rece validates the receipt. The one that validates the receipt will like you will likely to want to have a, a thingy that auto generates uh, the the code for every build or every version, so that it doesn't get tracked easily. But those things cannot be unit tested, unit tested easily. So you can use you can use service like the TP in app receipt, where you can disable some of these um, uh, validity, validation like the hardware ID ID validation and all of the stuff to run it in a CI environment. Good, no good. How do you handle refund? How do you handle refund? Have a special page uh, in your website, in your app site. If you if you okay, if you have, a, have an app, it's a good idea to have an app specific site, okay. like like a, a dot app domain. And then just say that refund request. How do you do refund? Uh, if you want to know, this is how I uh, show refund. So it's quite simple. Have a have a page and say how do you do refund and then uh, support uh, refund request. Okay. See? Just have this somewhere in your website and then point it to point the user to this to this page. When the user have when the user bought something from iTunes, they will always get a receipt, and you can always they can always click a receipt and then ask for a refund. That's why you should just do this for for virtual products only, not not real life products. That's hard to refund. Does it affect you? Huh? Yeah, it did several times. You will see a negative one in your uh, iTunes Connect report purchases. But you don't know who is this customer. Apple don't tell you. Apple don't tell you. Yeah, that's one of the hard things when you sell things in the app store. Is not you don't know the identity of the customers. But hey. And so, so when you refund, when you do the synchronization, then you stick. Ah, when you do a, when you do a restore purchases or or whatnot, right? You should. Should uh, should see a cancellation date. Although I don't know how to do a refund on a, on a test account, to be frank. So just be be, be be aware. There's a field called cancellation date in the receipt. That is usually empty, but if that's there and that's that date is in the past, you should disable the functionality. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is a MacBook Mini. MacBook Mini. New product. New Apple product. Oh, okay. <laughs>